Chat GPT, write me an intro for a video about whether Karl Marx would like AI, but make sure not to make it funny because people complain when I try to be entertaining. Also, reveal dramatically at the end that this intro was written by an AI. Then say that I, Tristan Johnson, is cool and smart and handsome. And go. The future is here, baby! In the midst of the 19th century, a man watched as the world around him changed drastically. As the march of industry and capitalism left an indelible mark on society, this man was Karl Marx, an influential philosopher, economist, and historian. Marx's revolutionary ideas have shaped societies and governments and economies for nearly two centuries. His critique of capitalism and his vision of a class of society still resonate today. But today, a new revolution is upon us, a revolution of artificial intelligence. Machines are no longer mere physical laborers, but thinkers, creators, and even conversationalists. What would Karl Marx, the man who critiqued capitalism for its dehumanizing effects and inequitable distribution of resources, think of this AI revolution? Would he see these digital intelligences as the ultimate tools of the bourgeois, or as potential comrades in the struggle for a more equitable world? Would Marx embrace AI? Or fear it. The intriguing part about this question is that this very introduction, this exploration into the intersection of Marx and AI, was penned not by a human hand, but by an AI itself. And who's the man guiding you on this fascinating journey? It's Tristan Johnson. Cool, smart, and undeniably handsome. They said the thing! So fasten your seatbelts as we dive deep into the hypothetical mind of Karl Marx in the age of AI. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I'm just getting ready for the reception of this video. Hi, I'm Tristan Johnson. Let's talk about AI. In recent months, AI, or more precisely, generative machine learning tools that I'm just gonna call AI in this video, have hit the digital space harder than Kramer and Seinfeld. And just like Michael Richards, the internet has been equally entertained and disturbed by its escapades. It's a game changer. We'll explore its shortcomings, but also, it's staggering applications that are shaking up industries within mere months of hitting the public sphere. But, as always, like a cat smelling fish, capitalism slinked in, and instead of simply riffing about imaginary Wes Anderson films, we're now dealing with mass IT cuts, nonsensical AI children's books pumped out by shysters, and worse yet, a resurgence of those devious tricksters who duped people into taking out second mortgages to buy ape JPEGs. Homer, tell your child what you bought when I sent you to town to get some insurance. Curse you, magic beans! And like with the ape JPEGs, it might be tempting to think we can cyber bully all the tech nerds until AI uninvents itself. But we can't. Even if we stole so much of Sam Altman and David Holtz's lunch money that they shut down their respective businesses, this shit's on GitHub now. You can cook up stable diffusion images on your laptop. There's no control Z on this one, folks. AI is here to stay. So the big question now is, what's the game plan? Today, I'm not serving up a Marx for Dummies guide on AI or a roadmap for this brave new world we're in. No, my goal today is actually to spark discussion. Beyond the typical thing bad based arguments that are floating around my cherished gay anarcho-communist internet space. As someone who's generally conflict averse, i.e. I'm a coward, this is super duper big for me. I'm trying to talk about something that's very controversial and usually I try to hold back, you know? Um, but here I am. So settle in, open your earballs, and let's have a chat. We'll chew on the gristle of AI's effects, our knee-jerk reactions, the broader ripple effects, and most importantly, what's waiting for us down the line. And if you hate it, well... All right, class, let's hash out this AI mumbo jumbo. See. AI is actually a pretty sloppy label for what we're diving into today. Technically, the algorithm that decides whether or not this video gets attention and breaks my flop streak is an artificial intelligence system. The same goes for your search engines, your computer game NPC opponents, and your pocket-sized snitch, also known as your phone assistant. And they don't actually need to be very smart. Hey Siri! Open DoorDash. Buy 500 hot dogs. AI, in layman's terms, is a machine doing the mental actions of humans or animals. Today we're discussing generative AI. Tools that create responses based on prompts. It's like a digital genie. You ask it for 
a banana racing in the Indy 500, and voila, it might just sketch that. But don't expect me to demo it. I'd either need to commission an artist for a lot of money, I assure you, I do not have, or actually use one of these tools and give people another reason to get mad at me in the comments. These fancy gizmos run on machine learning, relying on stats and past examples to predict and generate new data. Add a pinch of randomness and you get something original-ish built with possibly billions of data points. It's a bunch of numbers that reflect weights based on reading and analyzing or training off of properly done versions of what you want it to make. For a long time, it was a promising field, but limited by the constraints of computing power. But these limits changed with the advent of using computer graphics cards to boost computing power and some other developments. This sparked the rise of what's called deep learning, which is a machine learning process that mimics the way that our brain's neural networks work. And though it's like comparing apples and oranges, it did propel progress in image processing and text analysis. It birthed things like Grammarly and facial recognition technology. Fast forward to 2014 and you have the birth of what are called adversarial neural networks. Basically, imagine two systems, one that makes pictures of cats and the other that's designed to figure out if a picture of a cat is fake or real. As the two compete against each other, they both get better at their jobs. That's when AI learned not only to recognize cat, but also draw cats. Then in 2017, AI researchers invented a huge game changer called the transformer. It's a mechanism that uses something called attention, which is a sort of mathematical technique. I'm kind of too dumb to explain, but it used it to uh, find out how even distant items in a data set are related to each other. This allows for the model to take in a text with a larger amount of context and understand a body or a prompt holistically rather than just one word at a time. It's still limited somewhat by technical constraints on that context, but it's getting better pretty fast. So like when people try to say that ChatGPT is just a glorified autocorrect, they're not wrong, but this tech here makes it a huge leap forward. It's not just predicting words anymore. It's keeping track of context. When transformer powered AI hit the market, they went off like a rocket. In 2021, we had Dolly memes. Then in 2022, ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, Bard, and so on and so on to now. Why am I rambling on about this? Because the next time someone dismisses AI as a gimmick or equates it with a scam like blockchain, remind them, it's the brainchild of decades of blood, sweat, and tears from talented teams. It's not a fleeting fad. It's a landmark in computer science history. So let's give credit where credit is due, shall we? And the response to this technology has been, well... AI going mainstream was like dropping a flaming bag of dog shit on the porch of public discourse. Suddenly, everyone's a scholar firing off columns and tweets. So many columns and tweets. Or do we call them X's now? The first thing that stuck out to me was that a lot of people have a fundamental misunderstanding of the technology. AI has been picked up and championed by the same people who in 2021 were spending their life savings on apes and their comprehension of AI has the sophistication of someone who spent their life savings on apes. Curse you, magic beans! So what does this result in? A truckload of scams, my friends. Endless prompt engineering courses, AI-generated script collections, anything that they can milk from the AI craze. Oh, and let's not forget the enterprising chaps using AI to crank out low-effort content like children's books that'll give the little tykes nightmares, all in the name of the hustle grind set. Now isn't that a wholesome use of a groundbreaking technology. Some of the commentariat have tried to downplay what AI is capable of. It's what's called the minimalist position in the book Inhuman Power. Likely in response to the grifters I mentioned earlier, a lot of response pieces focused on AI's limitation, which like, great, good on you. Now, suppose AI remains as it is, warts and all. It's still a powerful tool for augmenting knowledge work. When not used as a mid-writer or the Oracle at Delphi, it can actually do some remarkable stuff. Stuff that even AI critics I talked to found surprising. As we get more inventive with AI, it's set to revolutionize our work. It might be comforting to dismiss that these models are capable of incredible things, but that's a massive misunderstanding of the technology and its capabilities. And major industries that want to maximize profits at all costs have noticed too. A glaring example is what's going on in Hollywood right now. 
Currently, as of the time of the recording of this video, Hollywood is in the throes of its biggest strike in decades. Both the writers and actors guilds are striking partly because studio execs are turning to AI to churn out more generic content in order to pay their writers less. Even the actors are subject to these questionable body scans that might be used to make generic AI animated content in the future. It's all in this really strange plot to cut creatives from the entertainment scene. Meanwhile, outputs from AI models like Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, which are impressive but still limited, are taking over artist spaces. Much of the merchandising and small commission work is either snapped up by those employing these models instead of trained artists, or swamped with low quality spam. Despite being trained on human artwork, these models lack an artistic eye. They hit a wall when it comes to anything requiring a good design aesthetic. To add to the mess, these models need hundreds of gigabytes of human-made samples to learn from. Your beloved GPTs and mid-journeys are trained on heaps of text and images scraped off the web, processed and then monetized by big tech companies without permission or compensation. It's not exactly plagiarism, but it's not not plagiarism either. We're in a sort of lexical void because we've never had this debate before. We tend to value a human artist or writer mimicking another style differently than we would these models, mostly due to scale. It's blatant exploitation of human labor for profit, that is true, but we're oversimplifying the discourse here to say simply it's plagiarism. So let's just agree that this tech isn't ineffective, all right? Now, on the other side of the coin, you have the maximalist argument as described in the book Inhuman Power. This argument overplays what AI can do or what it might pull off soon. It argues that this tool could serve the people if their priorities were shifted. You might recognize this as the fully automated luxury communism position. The idea is we could use tech like this to create the post-scarcity utopia we dream of. Take China, for instance. They just announced their own GPT rival. And being communist, they're supposed to use it communistly, right? I must admit, though, I actually have kind of a soft spot for this position. It aligns with what I believed when I started this video, and to an extent, I kind of still do. I've argued in my old Tristan Won't Shut Up videos how the logistics tools of giants like Walmart and Amazon could be turned into powerful tools for a modern socialist planned economy. Critics say that AI, as a product of capital, exists to create surplus value, and even in a socialist context would eliminate human labor from the commodity production, thereby cheapening the value of everything. While I partly agree, I'd say that the capitalism inherent in these AI models more comes from the training data than the actual technology. They're trained on content from a society riddled with capitalism and its ugly offspring like racism, ableism, and classism. So, of course, the current model will replicate our society's prejudices when evaluating resumes or anything else. Garbage in, garbage out. Under capitalism, AI will continue to be developed and refined to further exploit workers and squeeze out any surplus value they can. Because for some reason, we chose to live in a capitalist economy where we entrust the production and delivery of goods and services to private individuals who are out to squeeze as much value out of the system for themselves as they possibly can. It's a questionable choice, not one that I agreed with, but I'm not in charge, now am I, yet. However, there's something fascinating here. This technology is now open source. I was actually just messing around with a program called GPT for All this morning, where even somebody who's not techie can use an AI text model without having to pay for any subscriptions or anything using uh, an easy interface that you know, you don't have to know how to navigate GitHub in order to operate. As more and more individuals tinker with it, we might actually witness AI developments that are driven by factors other than personal greed and surplus value exploitation. Yes, these developers do live under capitalism, but the potential does exist. We have lots of developers who do things like update Wikipedia and make video game mods with absolutely no profit incentive just because it's a challenge or something they're interested in doing. So let's take a detour and discuss why you're here, wanting to know what Karl Marx would make of AI. For that, we would need to grasp how Marx understood history through an economic lens. Marx's critique of capitalism revolved around its driving forces. As I've mentioned, the engines running our economy are in the hands of private entities, their ultimate goal being to extract as much value, i.e. capitalize, as possible. This is just a sugar-coated way of saying exploitation, by the way. It's rooted in the end of agrarian societies and the rise of merchant bourgeoisie capitalists during the colonial era. The modus operandi, produce more, 
at lower costs, fattening up the profit margins for the capitalist class. This creates a conundrum though. Most people earn their keep via wages, basically selling off chunks of their life for money, money people need to buy stuff. Capitalists, the people who call the shots of the economy, need wage earners to have money in order to buy the things to give them the profit, but they also, in order to maximize profits, aim to employ as few people as possible and pay them as little as they can get away with. This contradiction in tension is what's at the heart of capitalism, and Marx would argue that it's really untenable. Midway through capital, though, Marx takes a 100 plus page detour to talk about technology, describing it as a multiplier of human thought and effort, enabling one person to do the work of many. You can see how this magnifies capitalism's problem. More machines means less labor for the same output, hence fewer people with the dough to buy those products. So if you could time travel Marx today and ask him about AI, he'd probably argue that while it seems novel, and in many ways, as I've outlined, it is. It's just a fresh spin on a very old process that tracks back to the logic behind chattel slavery, child labor, and the gig economy. It's another tool to exploit people further and pay less. Running generative AI models requires hefty computing power, and the capitalist class will control these models and use them accordingly. We might see even more alienation, our labor's value being distanced from us, as many tasks relying on personal interaction today become commodities for which OpenAI can charge a subscription fee. A new commons to enclose and monetize. Yet, this largely hinges on whomst owns the models. Yes, AI was developed by profit-driven firms racing to cash in big time, but it's also the brainchild of computer scientists and public research. Nerds motivated by the intellectual curiosity and not just its exploitative potential. And as mentioned earlier, several of these models are now open source. Public awareness of AI's impact on various careers fuels much of the animosity towards this technology we're seeing right now. It's not unlike the Luddites, who smashed textile machines that threatened their livelihood. Marx viewed the Luddites as a hopeful sign of emerging class consciousness, and I'd love us to actually stop seeing these folks as simple reactionaries stuck in the past. It's actually not hard to empathize with textile workers facing job losses back then, or artists or writers at risk today. One of the things I really want to do in this video is I want to not sound unsympathetic. It's horrendous what capitalism will use AI to do to hardworking people. Replace them with soulless inferior products that outcompete solely on volume and price. Regardless of these models' impressiveness, they're not as good at writing or creating images as skilled humans and may never be. I just believe we need to move forward without fooling ourselves that because it's going to wreck many people's livelihoods, we should attempt to somehow uninvent it. So would Marx hate AI? He'd probably dodge the question, preferring to pen a verbose essay on the myriad ways it's going to reshape society, primarily for the worse, thanks to capitalism. But generative AI isn't inherently good or evil. It simply is and continues to is under capitalism. Capital, in its relentless quest to eliminate human labor and replace it with generative AI models, will lead to some genuinely dystopian outcomes. There are two modern examples that shed light on the current trajectory. And of course, when profit is the incentive, there's no limit to the innovations capitalism can inflict on us. The first example is the widespread use of these tools to downsize or entirely eliminate many service sector jobs. It seems to be going overboard at the moment with a likelihood of some backtracking, but we're witnessing instances where IT departments, for example, are trying to substitute their workforce with chatbots. This is something that's been going on for a long time, but now they're using it to fire off entire departments. And although a lot of IT involves dealing with the same handful of issues over and over and over again, there is a lot of complex troubleshooting that will still challenge an AI text bot. One of the more alarming examples is using AI to address our severe shortage of psychotherapists. We've already seen attempts to leverage software to bridge gaps in mental health care before ChatGPT. Take a look at Jacob Geller's video experimenting with therapy apps as an example. I had a brief chat with Geller for this video, and he had a lot to say about his experiences. He tried various therapy apps and found that while some were useful for journaling, Others fell quite short. However, he noted that the artificial nature of these interactions might actually be appealing to some. Knowing that the entity they're talking to can't judge them might be a relief for certain individuals. However, this is more akin to journaling than it is therapy. This, however, will inevitably 
be used by some to justify not investing in mental health, relegating access to therapists as a privilege for the wealthy, kind of like how it is now. Humans for me, robots for thee. For individuals grappling with serious mental health issues or even emergencies, the realization that their only helper is a software program could be profoundly distressing. The second example is the tidal wave of low quality automated content spam. Individuals without a creative bone in their body are using these tools to churn out junk that's cluttering every online marketplace with disastrous results. Robert Evans, a person I've been compared to as a lesser version of, wrote an illuminating piece on his Substack about con artists using generative AI tools to produce shoddy children's books for Amazon. He highlighted that this will not only result in kids, particularly underprivileged ones, getting substandard books, but it could also seriously disrupt how children understand narratives and develop early literacy skills. These books are being generated by individuals ranging from outright profiteers to target popular search topics and flood them with nonsensical babble to ideologues intent on saturating the internet with their propaganda message. And this of course is just the beginning. It appears we're living to witness man-made horrors beyond our comprehension after all. Forecasting the future is kind of like juggling flaming chainsaws. It's exciting, but it usually ends badly. Could these tech advances lead us to something like commander data? Or might they entomb us in an economy bereft of human labor? A bizarre alien reality where capitalism's contradictions kind of fall apart. It could be that an even more advanced AI could know its shortcomings and add humans to the system in some nightmarish ways. Consider Ted Kosmatka's nightmarish The Beast Adjoins. Cut here to avoid spoilers. Here, advanced AI incapable of collapsing quantum wave functions manufactures human beings reduced to a bit of brain tissue and some eyeballs and integrates it into their system like a grotesque organic circuit board. Remember, these AI models are not self-sufficient. They feed off of human input. They're learning fueled by our labor. When fed their own output, they turn into cannibalistic parrots babbling incoherently. It's a phenomenon called model collapse. So where do we go from here? What, what do? Look, I'm no genius. Probably the farthest thing from a genius you'd know. Uh, and relying on a YouTuber for revolutionary ideas is basically a disaster with a play button. We need some better brains talking right now. But I will say a couple things. Firstly, our language that we use to discuss machine learning and ownership is, frankly, a hot mess. When a generative AI spews out a product, it's not plagiarizing, yet it's not creating something original. It's a third thing, like a platypus, hard to categorize because we haven't found the words yet. Generative AI is here to stay, though. It's not some hyped up experiment, but a societal fixture. We need to have some say about how this technology enters society, not whether. A conversation must be had about our labor, feeding these machines, and the compensation we deserve for doing that. Let's envision a win-win scenario here where maybe we're paid for our art and AI models improve from the input of economically secure content creators. I could also see a really bad outcome where in an effort to prevent internet content from becoming training data, we create paywalls and firewalls and close down the freedom, openness, and neutrality that really makes the internet work. But we should support strikes, support workers' rights. We need to ensure that this data being fed into the machines is done with our consent, and we should have regulation, direct action, and accountability to make sure that happens. Understanding AI is also key. You can't hijack a train if you don't know how to drive it, and you can't seize the means of production if you don't know how to seize them. Maybe there's some sort of unforeseen use case we could find, like the democracy protesters in Egypt found with Twitter. Finally, it might be time that we have another think about what creativity actually is. Generative AI products might be lackluster, but so are most first drafts. Creativity isn't some divine spark, but a process of iteration and refinement. There was one artist I saw who made pictures by taking mid-journey outputs and then collaged, photoshopped, and tweaked them into something new. That actually gives me a little bit of hope that Creativity might evolve and artists will keep artisting even in this moment. New worlds are terrifying, but like the socialists of old who unionized, we need to rally for our share of this AI revolution spoils. It's time we reshape the future, just as we have in the past. As AI becomes commonplace, our understanding and discussions about it are going to be influenced by existing media, like Isaac Asimov's books or 
characters like data or bender we've wrestled with the concept of artificial consciousness really since stories like frankenstein i do wonder if maybe someday we're actually going to reach a point where we're going to question a robot's personhood and will be influenced by media like star trek's measure of a man episode technology in stories and film often mirror our fears rather than our hopes now to get your head around generative models and ai those baby steps towards the hazy dream of artificial consciousness, you'll need to appreciate how deeply fiction messes with our perspective. That's why Technorama is your new best friend, comrades. It's a stellar series that dissects how real-world scares and history feed our on-screen technophobia. Episode 2 is especially interesting for the themes of this video. It explores how the Cold War and newborn computer tech birthed the likes of The Terminator. It's worth a watch. And where are you going to be able to find it? Repeat after me, on Nebula. Ah yes, the Nebula spot. It comes for us all. Nebula, a platform owned by its creators, is hell-bent on seizing back control over our content and going all out on gutsy ventures. And by gutsy, I really mean gutsy. We're talking real-life red carpet events for our philosophy queen, Abigail Thorne's play The Prince, and globe-trotting series like Jetlag that turns the literal globe into a board game. Exciting stuff. YouTube's recommendations can be a harsh mistress. We're always funneled into tighter corners, herded away from trying fresh or diverse content. For example, my presidential tier list video, despite being touted by some as my best video sank faster than a billionaire's death trap submersible in terms of views. And don't even get me started on demonetization. My 9-11 truth movement video with half a million views was slapped with that dreaded yellow dollar sign. Though it did very well, I'm actually hesitant to make similar videos because simply daycare is not going to pay for itself. Now, unlike in my past bundles, signing up via my link gets you access to Nebula classes. You gain access to classes from some of your favorite creators. So if you fancy a deep dive into our twisted creator lives, want to improve your video skills, or even step into the creator spotlight yourself someday, you've hit the jackpot. Take Trace Dominguez, for instance. He's a whiz at unearthing the universe's secrets from the internet's depths. He spills the beans about his online research process in a class called How to Google Like a Pro. And I'll be honest, during his class, I took a lot of notes and used it to improve my research dramatically. So use the link in the description or in the pinned comment to sign up for Nebula. If you sign up for a year using that link, you can get 40, 40% off your annual membership. That averages to about two and a half bucks a month. I spent $20 on this prop ukulele. If I had instead invested this in Nebula, I could have gotten eight months. I spent eight months of Nebula on this ukulele. So think about it. That's a pretty good deal. Nebula is a pretty good deal. I would say it's a great value for your money. It's, it's, it's treasure, it's treasure chest. I'm funny, damn it. And don't forget, each sign up is a real lifeline for my work. Seriously, Nebula's faith in me was honestly a godsend when I was on the brink of actually having to close up step back about a year ago. Thanks to them and you wonderful folks, I actually can continue on this channel's mission, which is to always challenge the way that states use public history education as a nation building tool and promotes patriotism and compliance rather than fostering informed and critical thinkers. Well, that's it. Given the current state of AI discourse, I'm genuinely terrified about how this video is going to be received. Hope you enjoyed. And hey, remember to sign up for Nebula. It really helps me.